Hey, big sister. What's your least favorite show? That gets my gift. So this is Rish Outfield again. And this is still Big Anglovich, too. And we're still talking about Marvel's The Avengers. The point I guess I was trying to make was just that this hadn't been done before. It opened so big. But what I heard was that people who had never seen the other five movies went to see this. And maybe you need that for this kind of gross. I think so. But I don't understand. I, I, I find that so hard to believe. And I'll tell you why. Again, I movies cost so much. Do you really go see a movie? You're standing in line for the movie and you buy a ticket for something you don't know what it is. Plus, we've had five years or, or however many years where people could catch up with these things on video. So surely every single Marvel movie that comes out gains tons of new fans that had never seen it in the theater, that, that see it on video or see it when it comes on pay-per-view or TV or cable or download illegally. And so <laughs> I, I would think that way more people saw Incredible Hulk in 2010 than saw it in 2008 in the theater. It's but, possible. I think... A certain set of people went and saw The Incredible Hulk, but they never saw any of the others. Nobody that saw The Incredible Hulk saw the others. And then a certain group of people only saw Iron Man, didn't see any of the others. You know, it went that way for all the movies. Then finally they all got together and it was like Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans. And Lord of the Rings and Lo- fans. Yeah, they're all, they all finally f- had something that brought them together. Like the Hulk fans were there and they're like, we love Hulk. And the other fans were <laughs> sure that was it that was my criticism <laughs> last year to that mindset somebody somewhere thought that there was a different audience for all of those and my thought was no same guy who saw iron man 2 also saw thor or, you know whatever it was but these numbers they may prove me wrong on that and and it, it is also possible that somebody who knows of these characters and didn't go see them in the theater or didn't see all of them or you know was a casual fan saw the commercials and were like wow all of those guys well, this is one to see opening night if we can. Yeah. And and they made it more of a priority. And I don't know how much like word of mouth counts for opening weekend because. Yeah, I think it's more got to be ad campaign. When, for example, yeah. when we saw Green Lantern, did we know that it was going to suck by the time we bought our tickets? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. Anyhow, it did extremely well. And that's good for Marvel. And good for Joss Whedon. And and um, you know what? I care so much more about the man, Joss Whedon, than I care <laughs> about this organization, this faceless corporation, which is Marvel. And I was hoping that the movie would be good and that he would get at least some of the credit for that so that he could do what he wanted with his career. Because the man is brilliant and he's unlike anybody else. And for so long... It's been an uphill battle for this yeah, guy to every- do the things that he wants to do. This is an off-topic thing, but you remember that Buffy comic book podcast adaptation that I did the voice of Giles for? Mm-hmm. The story of that was based on the story that Joss Whedon wrote for this Faith movie that was supposed to happen in like 2006, 2005, and nobody would make it. Fox owned this thing. They wouldn't show it. The WB showed Buffy. UPN showed Buffy. Neither of them would make it. You know, they just didn't care. So it went nowhere. The only thing he could do with it was make a comic book of this idea. Giles was going to have his own series. It was called Ripper. And they wrote several episodes, like six episodes. And they were trying to get the BBC to put the money in because nobody in America would do it. That still didn't happen. It's just sad that this guy has wanted to do so much stuff and he couldn't. To the point where he had to make Dr. Horrible as a friggin' web series. <laughs> well, maybe that was always that. intended yeah, to Yeah, I be. think he may have done that as a, hey, it's the writer's strike and F you, Hollywood, and this is what we can do without you. So there. That's one of the reasons, I mean, I think we talked about it in our pre-Avengers conversation about I, we just hoped that it would be great so that Joss Whedon would finally be able to say, I mean, can you imagine, I, where would Chris Nolan be? Without Batman Begins and Dark Knight. It's hard to say. He would because not be what he is for sure. The Prestige was a really good movie, but it didn't, didn't make, make that money. much money. Would Inception yeah. exist if it weren't for those films? I don't think so because Probably that not. who knows how much money that movie cost. And for a movie that cerebral to get made, somebody had to believe in that guy. Right. And would they have believed in him based on the script alone? I don't think so. Yeah, it's all based on how much money he brought in with his other movies and half of the reason why... That's how Prestige got made. 
that was part of his contract is one for me, one for you. And he did Batman Begins. And he's like, okay, the next movie I want to make is Prestige. And they said, no, 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 Batman 2, that's the next movie you want to make. And he's like, well, this is, this is my contract if you want me to do it. And they're like, okay, okay. Right. That's half of the reason why Inception made the money that it did too is because people are like, oh, Chris Nolan, that's the guy that did Dark Knight. I'm there. I'll check that out. I'll totally give it a chance. And so it made way more than had it just been done by somebody else. If Joss Whedon had made Inception, and people were like, eh, I could probably skip that one. I don't know who Joss Whedon is, so I'm not even going to bother. Well, it's very possible that eight months from now, or knowing Joss, six months from now, we get a movie that says, from the director of The Avengers, you know? And they'll use that because they think that that can put butts in seats, and maybe it will. Because people had an experience with this movie, and people had an experience with Dark Knight. That doesn't happen all the time. Right. They gave it an A+. And so, good luck to him. More power to him. I, I hope... That he is able to make his dreams come true. Yeah, I'm excited. I hope that Joss Whedon has finally arrived because he should have arrived a long time ago. He shouldn't have had so much trouble to get through. It's really your fault. It is. Because when somebody likes Firefly as much as you do and you don't watch every episode of Buffy the Vampire (laughs) Slayer. I'm I'm sure I eventually will. The problem is I just don't have time to sit and watch every episode of TV shows anymore. But yeah, I'm excited to see. I know somebody posted on Facebook. They're like, yeah, Joss Whedon made this awesome Avengers movie. And I'm so excited for Joss Whedon because, you know, I've loved him from this and that and this. And now he may well be able to go and do whatever it is that he wants to do. If Joss Whedon was fulfilling your dreams instead of his own dreams, what would your dream be? And pretty much everybody who responded was like, what I want is that because of Marvel's Avengers, people start getting interested in other things that Joss has done. Firefly has a new resurgence and we finally get the rest of the big damn trilogy. (laughs) We get to see... Well, see, that's a funny object in space to pun mercilessly (laughs) because that's something where like everybody that was involved in firefly still talks about it all these years later nathan fillion still says you know if i had 10 million dollars i'd buy the rights of firefly myself and and people go "Ooh, ooh, ooh, can he do that kind of you know they get all excited it's really rare that somebody is part of a project and they still talk about that Because, like, Castle is way more successful than Firefly ever was. Right. You know what I mean? It's so weird. that It's like V on ABC was a failure. Still 10 times more successful than Firefly ever was for (laughs) Morena Baccarin. You know, they had an episode of Castle just the other day with Adam Baldwin in it. Cool. And Adam Baldwin and Nathan Fillion go around... And he, like, follows Adam Baldwin. And Adam Baldwin is just this insane, crazy cop. But he wants to get, like, some new ideas to spice up the Nicky Heat books. And it was pretty fun. Although Adam Baldwin, his character was so despicable. He just (laughs) hated him. Cool. He wasn't lovable like Jane is at all. He was just, like, (laughs) similar character because he was all crazy and muscle and violence. But And, yeah, Chuck, that show that Adam Baldwin did, was so much more popular, famous, or successful, money-making, long-lived than Firefly. And yet that's what they keep talking about. And I guess maybe there was some kind of magic on the set and they were aware of it. And that kind of goes back to that Doing Steve episode, the how do you know when when you're writing something, when everything's firing on all thrusters and you're just like, well, holy crap, this is the best thing I've ever written or this is so good. I don't know that you would realize that making a movie because you're working on a third of a page for six hours Mm -hmm. and you don't see the whole, the big picture and all that, even on something like the Avengers. I mean, how many of those guys worked with Tom Hiddleston? Loki was all throughout that movie, but he wasn't interacting with people all that much. It's his experience for making the Avengers is totally different than Scarlett Johansson's or Samuel L. Jackson's or, Mark Ruffalo's or whatever. I don't know if those guys even had a scene together. Anyhow, hopefully they were like, wow, this is the most fun ever. Sign me up. And it's Monday. And I, you know, I totally expected Marvel to have a press conference today and say, this is what's coming up. You know, we want to thank Joss Whedon and he is fired. And <laughs> he'll never work in this town again. We're going to go on to do, you know, because it seems like that's what Hollywood does 
It's like, okay, everybody's talking about us. Let's let them know what's coming. We know there's going to be an Avengers 2, and Joss has already talked about his ideas for it. So he is contractually attached to Avengers 2, but it hasn't got a release date. And these movies take so long to get made. You would think they'd say, okay, we'll start shooting Avengers 2, you know, summer of 2013 or whatever. But they do have Iron Man 3 coming out next year, and it starts shooting, I think, in June of this year. And they've got Thor 2 coming out next year, but it's not till Christmas time. Oh, so they're going to split them in like six months. And then the next summer we get Captain America 2 and some mystery movie. Ant-Man. It has a release date, but they've not told us what it is. Power Man. And so I, it could be anything. It, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people have been saying Doctor Strange because at the beginning of Thor, you see the eye of Agamotto in, in like the armory of Asgard. And uh, that's, I guess, the source of Doctor Strange's powers or something. He'll, he'd say, by the eye of Agamotto, and, and you know he would be able to cast a spell. I don't know. Anyhow, that's off topic. But when Disney promoted John Lasseter to be like head of animation, we were so excited because we felt like, okay, not only will the Pixar movies be great, but everything, all of the animation slate will rise up. And I mean, having seen Tangled, I don't know if that had anything to do with John Lasseter, but... That was better than but Meet it was the Robinsons. Hell, yes, it was. Chicken Little. Lasseter's name's on Meet the Robinsons, too. So, uh, you know, if, if that sucked, then that's his fault in the same way. But he wasn't the director or... He had a very... It was... Stuff. That was out pretty All quickly All he did was he fire arrived. the original director, remember? Yeah. But it would be so great if Whedon could be on that board and have at least a say... Why don't you try this? Or, you know, here's a funny line yeah. that Doctor Strange could say. Because, you know, that was something that he would do so well. Now, granted, these were his shows, it's the like Buffy shows or whatever. But the writers on those shows would always talk about, you know, as like, Joss gave me complete freedom to write my episode of Angel. And when I handed it in, you know, they shot it. And he went through and added a couple of really funny lines that I get credit for. People always say that's the funniest line in the whole series. And I'm like, yeah, just wrote that. I didn't. But you know what I mean? He, <laughs> he was willing to let them take the credit for what he did because he could see how it could be better. And, and apparently he had some input in Captain America. Yeah, I was going to say that. He uh, did take a pass was, at it or it something like that. It was uncredited. So there's no knowing whether... He actually had anything to do with it, whether he was just there saying, we need Cap to get to this point for the Avengers. I don't know. I'll ask him sometime. But if he could be in some way helping push these toward being like the Avengers and less like Iron Man 2, that would be great. But apparently, you know, he sat down with Shane Black, who's writing and directing Iron Man 3, and said, okay, this is where Tony is going to be at the end of the Avengers. Can you make it so it's the same Tony in the same situation. And, and Shane Black was like, yeah, we'll pick up right after and, and we'll reference Avengers. You know, it'll be hand in hand. And I was just like, what a great idea. Because that's what you need yeah, to show people that it's the same universe and to have consistency. And that's what comic books, when they were at their best, would do. You knew that Spider-Man was in the same city as the Fantastic Four because they both had shared experiences or, you know, whatever it was, some crossover thing or, or just the same buildings in the background. So I've been talking and talking. What would you like to see in Avengers 2? I don't know. I was just thinking about that. I, I, obviously, we've got that little mid credit sequence where uh, they kind of give you a teaser as to what the next one is. And I had no idea at all what that is. You told me you have no idea, really. You knew like the figure or something like that of this guy. Well, I, I told you what I knew. Yeah. And, and let me just repeat it because... You know, it's possible that somebody out there doesn't know who that guy was at the end. It's possible. Alexis Denisov, who played Wesley Wyndham Price on Buffy and Angel. No idea? He's married to Allison Hannigan, who played Willow on Buffy and Angel. He played this character called The Other, who's the one that speaks, who's the guy that tasks Loki with going and getting the cube and saying, in return, you can rule the Earth. And... There's somebody else sitting next to him. And I didn't realize it till the second time I saw it. But that guy is always there in this throne. And at the end, the other is telling this his boss that Loki has failed, that our plan has failed. The invasion didn't work. 
you know, these humans are much more powerful than we thought they were, to go against them is to court death. Is to court death. And this and character smiles. stands and smiles. And that character is Thanos. And he is this cosmic entity, cosmic despot of the Marvel Universe. They, cosmic in the, baddie, as in they the, say in the in UK. The, in the DC Universe, there's this guy called Darkseid. And I guess Thanos is Marvel's answer to Darkseid. He, they, he has tons of stuff in common with Darkseid, the same way that Captain America is Marvel's Superman in a way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, he's this cosmic entity who is all powerful, pretty much. And in the Marvel Universe, Death, with a capital D, the Grim Reaper, is a woman. And he is in love with her, hopelessly in love with her. And all the things that he does, he comes up with these schemes of destruction and, and chaos and madness. And, and it's always to impress death. You know, it's like if I kill a billion people, she will notice me. And so that was sort of a pun at the end of that movie. You know, to go against them is to court death. And he smiles. But yeah, honestly, I didn't know any more than I, what I just said. In fact, I probably knew less than that. But, but I recognized him. But Marvel has like a whole subsection or, or, or pantheon of cosmic characters and heroes and villains and aliens and, and all sorts of things, which we've seen a bit of as the Silver Surfer is one of them. Galactus is one of them. And, and so I've never really been familiar with Thanos and the, the side of the Marvel Universe that's that stuff. So it, it sort of blew me away when they showed that. But it was neat because I caught the reference and, and the, the, the pun. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was amusing. And I thought that this character, the other, was a Skrull because he has a, a distinctive pointed chin or serrated chin like the Skrulls do. And the Skrulls are the main alien race of Marvel Universe, the main bad, evil alien race out there. And they're mm -hmm. shapeshifters and they're, they're schemers. And unfortunately, they are most well known as Fantastic Four villains. And because of that, they are owned by Fox. Oh. So the other is not a Skrull. But in the spin-off comic series, Ultimate Avengers, the Ultimates, their version of the Skrulls were this species called the Chitari. And they were a shape-shifting alien species, but we never knew what their true form was because they always appeared as whatever they wanted to appear. And so they just took the name of the Ultimate Universe's equivalent to the Skrulls and used them for the alien invaders in this movie of the Avengers. And so I guess... Technically, they're not the Skrulls, and technically Fox has no Guess that's a good way platform to complain about. But in researching this, because I did do some reading so that I could answer that question for you, <laughs> I found out this totally crazy bit of, of trivia. There are two members of the Avengers called Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch. Uh -huh. And they were originally X-Men villains way back in like X-Men number three, yeah, early created on. by Stan and Jack. Part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. They were, but they were sort of conflicted. They, you know, they didn't know whose side they wanted to be on. And Stan created these characters. And then a few issues later, he thought it would be fun to bring them on as baddies for the Avengers to fight. And eventually, he had them join the Avengers. And for years and years, they were known as Avengers. And then during the 70s, when there were no X-Men, there was this cool revelation that their father is actually... Magneto. Magneto, the arch nemesis of the X-Men, was their father. And because they have sort of one foot in the X-Men universe and one foot in the Avengers universe, Marvel Studios and 20th Century Fox came to an agreement that they can be in both franchises. Ooh. They can be in the Avengers as long as... There's no mention that they are mutants and that their father is Magneto. And ditto, they can be in the Avengers as long as you don't say these are from the X-Men or any of that stuff. And I was just like, well, somebody somewhere has to leap on this and cast the same two people and have them in both because it's having your cake and eating it too. Now, obviously, Fox won't do that because <laughs> they will feel like we're giving free advertising to Disney. 
but they, they need to wait until Disney casts them and then after they've done that now cast the same people because then they get the free advertising <laughs> instead because you know Fox would do that I, I bag on Fox I, I actually quite dislike Fox as a studio but you know it's probably not the same people responsible for all the things that I you know complain about these regimes change so fast it's like a football team right a roster changing up and it's like i hate the minnesota vikings because in 1987 (laughs) and i'm sure there are fans that feel that way but it's it makes no sense you'd be like nobody is the same on that team the owners aren't even the same you know there's one equipment guy that's been around (laughs) since then but so i guess that was kind of a roundabout way of me saying i think it would be really cool if we could see at least scarlet witch in a future Avengers movie because, yeah. well, she's she's really powerful and her powers are interesting and unique. And that's something that we talked about when we first saw that trailer is you see Hulk, you see Captain America, you see Iron Man, you see a guy with a huge arsenal of trick arrows, and then you see Black Widow and she's got the, the world's smallest pistol. I mean, it's <laughs> practically a Derringer. And it's almost laughable. It's like, well, what can she... Oh, and there's a god next to her, too. What could she possibly do? And as we've said, well, Joss gave her a heck of a lot to do. But in that moment, you're just like, well, she's not... She has no power. She, can, You know, it's just amazing that she could fight side by side with these guys. But Scarlet Witch is one of those where she could fight Thor. You know, she's so powerful. And I, and I don't know that you would want to go that far. With because uh, because eventually like Brian Michael Bendis, a comic book writer, had her go insane, and when she lost her mind, her powers just went out of control. So to the point where she became a threat to the universe, kind of thing, uh, which they always have happened to these poor female characters. <laughs> but it, it was interesting because when she was created way back in the day, she was easily the least powerful. Yeah, her character, her her power was. To make people have bad luck. Yeah. And so, like, she made bad luck happen to a guy who was walking by with a suitcase. And his suitcase opened and all the stuff fell out. And then one of the X-Men tripped in the stuff. It was, it was pretty ridiculously But stupid. eventually they started to say, well, is it bad luck or is it magic? And they're like, okay, what if it was black magic? What if it was some kind of hex power? And that, and they got to the point where they were just like, okay, she changes the the probability of things happening. So anything she wants to happen could happen. And that, when you start talking about that, that's what a god is. That anything I want comes to pass. And that, and so, I, I don't know. I think that would be really interesting. And, yeah. and, and One it, of my favorite uh, X-Men comic books is the uh, House of M. I love that, where she remade the entire world with her power. And yeah, if you've not heard of that, I mean, a lot of people hate it. But it's after she's lost her mind... And she basically takes her friends and says all of their dreams came true. The people that were loyal to her have the world remade so that they are happy. And and the world is just a totally different place. A kind of a horrible place for those that aren't like her. Right. Anyhow, um, that's what I would like to see. But just because Joss excels at these powerful women or these women. And someday I'm just going to lend you the box set of Buffy. But Willow gets to this point at some point. I mean, she begins to become more and more and more and more powerful. And the power just eats at her until the point where she's like, I don't have to do anything you guys tell me. You have to do what I say. And she becomes a global threat. She becomes the big bad of that season where you're just like, holy crap. And he does it so excellently well because you see it coming little by little. But Willow is so sweet and innocent and good that you don't believe Uh that it could happen. And when it finally does, it's sad more so than anything. You know, he's like, no, no. But what's the solution other than killing her? And how do you kill somebody that's become that powerful? And it's just, oh, it's so awesome. When they get to that point. And, and you could tell that it's something that he picked up either from reading the Dark Phoenix saga in the X-Men comics or just, you know, talking about, well, what is magic and what what are her possibilities? And, you know, it's like, what if there were no limits to your power in that? And how could a person stay good, stay centered, stay innocent 
like that. And, 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 and I don't know. I mean, maybe he's already done it and he'd be like, yeah, sorry, I did that already. I wouldn't want to do the Scarlet Witch thing. But just the idea of somebody who was the weakest member of the team, like Scarlet Witch was, becoming the strongest member of the team that's something that would be neat. And, and, you know, we did see it with Phoenix. I mean, that's when it happened first. Jean Grey in the old X-Men comics, when Stan created her, she was like the cheerleader, you know? She she didn't really have any power that could do anything. She could make things float. And eventually they're just like, well, what if we decided to make her so powerful that with a thought she could kill a billion people? That's the most, probably the most famous X-Men story ever told. And it hadn't been done before, and that's probably why it resonated with so many people. Uh, it was done really, really well. But I don't know. I'm, I'm going on and on, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm monopolizing the, <laughs> the, the time, your time. It's all right. We're talking about comic books, so that's kind of expected. But uh, it, it, what I would like to see, obviously it seems like Joss has already got a plan involving Thanos or something like that. But when I was a kid... Probably the first connection to comic books that I had would be the Super Friends cartoon. Okay, I, and a lot of us were like that. Maybe Superman the movie would beat that, but I'm not sure. Super Friends was probably the first thing that I ever saw that had to do with comic book stories. And in Super Friends, they would have to fight the Legion of Doom. Right, which was a, an evil team. It was Yeah, basically the evil Justice League it was a bunch of villains from other various comic books you know it was batman villains it was superman villains you know lex Luthor would lead the team and scarecrow was on the team and solomon grundy solomon grundy was on the team and you know captain cold was the flash villain and they and a lot of times when they would go out and fight they would fight their own villains when they would do their plans but that is something that could be interesting maybe it wouldn't maybe it would be too much because Already you've got a big team of good guys and you have to give all these people something interesting to do. And trying to give all the bad guys something interesting to do as well might be more than a movie can handle. Except, did you not feel like Loki had as much to do as Iron Man or Captain America? I did feel that Loki... I'll say it. He had more to do in The Avengers than he did in Thor. Yeah, I think he he probably did. He was given a lot to do, but that was one villain. If you times that by six or seven, oh, okay, I hear what you're saying. And that's going to make it pretty hard to give each. You're saying if there was a a bunch of villains, so maybe that would be a bad idea because you know we've talked about it before. Spider-Man three was not as good as the other ones, and I think one of the main reasons was because there had too many villains in it. Nothing was satisfying. All those Batman movies with Val Kilmer and Batman and Robin and etc., it seemed like each time they're like, oh, we got to have more villains, so they'd have three, and they'd have four. You know, they'd have Bane and Poison Ivy and Mr. Freeze and a bunch of guys on skates with uh, hockey The hockey team from hell. <laughs> And guys that were jumping out of planes with surfboards. Boys in bikinis, girls with surfboards. So that might not be a good idea, but that could be interesting. Okay, if we were going to have an, a Masters of Evil, for example, that's that's a superhero team from the Marvel Universe that I think is an Avengers group of, of, of bad guys. Would you want them to be new characters that are from the comics but we've not seen or would you want to see red skull and see i was just thinking that i think it would be cool if the next avengers movie did include red skull because he is what happened to him at the end of i've totally drawn a blank he got sucked into the sky by the tesseract so he's out there but we don't know that he was killed that's kind of what happened to loki at the end of the thor movie is he just fell into oblivion whatever so kind of the same thing so you can easily bring the red skull back and yeah having loki again the incredible hulk had what well they they tried to set up was the abomination dead at the end i thought he was i haven't seen the movie since it came out yeah but i I distinctly remember hulk like breaking his back or something like that and it being over or breaking his neck or something but they also set up samuel stearns who was played by tim the leader what was his name? Three names. Tim Blake Nelson. And yeah, he's the arch nemesis to the Hulk, except for maybe 
uh, Thunderbolt Ross, who was also in it. He's the guy w- whose gamma radiation makes him incredibly smart instead of incredibly strong. It was kind of a shame that we didn't get a sequel to that because you could see that that was a a card that you were setting aside to play later, like the Joker card at the end of Batman Begins. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't know. The, the Hulk was so beloved in this new movie. I mean, people friggin' loved him that they'd be crazy if they weren't going to do a, a Incredible Hulk sequel now. And just, yeah, okay, it's Mark Ruffalo now instead of right. Edward Norton. I, that's something that we talked about before, but I'm not going to care that much if it's Mark Ruffalo in Incredible Hulk 2 because he was so good. Yeah. And, and I, I don't know if that was because he was so well written or because Mark Ruffalo is that charming and talented. It's hard to say. And it's the, the writer's job to make the actor sound good. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. the director's job to make the actor look good. So we can just have them share credit. Yeah. But, but yeah, that that would be But we see the leader see. and the Red Skull and how about the Mandarin? <laughs> we have a trio of bad guys. People keep saying that they're not going to do the Mandarin because it's politically incorrect. But uh, uh, come on, many? that's that's horseshit, dude. <laughs> Just because it, I mean, look, you know, if we called the guy the limey, it's, yeah, it's not even that because Mandarin isn't a racial slur. It's not. I'm trying to think the fact that he's uh... OK. Here, here's what it is. You call a bad guy the Mexican and they're like, oh, you can't do that. It's like, well, no, it's just where he's from. And he's like, no, no, that's racist. And I understand that the word Mexican, when you say it a certain way, sounds racist, but it depends on how you do it that should matter. I mean, you have Ricardo Montalban or whatever as your bad guy. It doesn't matter that he's a Mexican actor or whatever. It's, it's, it's how he's written and how he, he acts. I mean, Khan is a, an Indi- he's a Sikh, Khan Noonien Singh. And yet he was played by a Mexican so wonderfully, you know, I, I, I don't know. Anyhow, they, they keep saying that they were going to do the Mandarin and then they're not going to do it. And John Favreau came right out and said, we couldn't do the Mandarin because it's racist. And I had this big argument with my friend Jeff, who's much more like politically connected than I am. And I was like, you have to explain to me like I'm a child why it's racist to have the Mandarin. And he couldn't do it. He says, well, you can do it in a racist way. But just having a character called the Mandarin doesn't necessarily make it racist. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like if they had, I don't know, a black guy as your bad guy, is it necessarily racist just because he's black? Hell no. If you write him and he's formidable or whatever, his skin color doesn't matter. And and you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm naive. Maybe we haven't gotten to the point, even with a black president, where people will say that color doesn't matter but the mandarin is iron man's red skull he is the arch nemesis of iron man and he uses magic whereas tony stark uses technology and yeah i guess he's asian but i still don't understand and and if you have a a different take on it as to why it's wrong to have an asian bad guy let me know I don't know. I don't think so. I just watched uh, Big Trouble in Little China not too long ago. They had lots of Asian bad guys in that, and I still loved it. The darkest magic. They had Asian good guys, too. Maybe that's what they need. And, and yes, they need to have both there's somehow. no reason why you can't have allies to Tony Stark that are also from China or the Mandarin. Because the way they established him in the first movie, I mean, they didn't come out and say, but there was it was the like Union of the Ten Rings or something like that. And that's the deal with a Mandarin. Is he has a ring on each of his fingers, and each one gives him a different ability. But why can't he be like a Cobra Commander kind of thing? And there are different nationalities of guys that work with him. They're afraid of offending this huge new market, which is China. But you don't need to. For example, the the last Mummy movie, as terrible as it was, Jet Li was the bad guy, right? They had tons of bad Asian guys in that, but they had good Asian guys as well. It was co-financed by China, which Iron Man 3 is also. So I don't see what the problem is. And maybe maybe there is no problem. It's one of those things like when Robert Downey Jr. played the white guy dressed as a black guy in Tropic Thunder, and they were so afraid that this was going to offend people. And the audience saw it and were like, no, we get the joke. 
you know, we're not going to set fire to Detroit. It's fine. <laughs> it's a joke. I, I, I don't know. I, I would love to see the Mandarin. I don't know anything about him. But if he's important enough to have been Tony Stark's greatest enemy for 50 years, then I'd like to see him. Right. Sorry. Yeah, it would be interesting to see all those uh, various characters f- come back from other films. That's what I'd like to see is something like that. And maybe they still need to set up something. Maybe in Iron Man 3, they need to set up the Mandarin so he can be part of the evil league of evil. <laughs> maybe they need to bring in Bad Horse and Dr. Horrible. I don't know. <laughs> Kevin Feig, who is the, the, the head of Marvel Studios, said that the... Uh, the Horrible. The f- Death Winnie... <laughs> he said that the Avengers culminate all of these first films and then starting with Iron Man 3 it's a new era a new series where those will all be interconnected and building on one another and my guess is it'll be even more so because they tried it a little bit in these and it worked so well they're like oh let's try this all the way through right. and like when we saw Thor and they had that stuff with Hawkeye you know some People probably won't even remember that. But if they ever see Thor again, they'll be, oh, cow, that's Hawkeye. That's the same guy mm-hmm. from Avengers. And that's the sort of thing Hawkeye that you want to do. Like, yeah, we, we met. Well, we didn't meet. I watched you sleep. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't watching you sleeping. I, I was present while you were unconscious. The, the ending does seem to hint that Thanos is next. But I probably wouldn't. I, I would wait. I would give more hints of Thanos in the next one and maybe have that be the third. You and I had talked about, back when I thought that it was possible for Skrulls to be in this, we thought that maybe they would be building towards some kind of alien invasion by the Skrulls. And piece by piece, we would be revealing certain members of Certain people on Earth were sleeper agents and they were actually Skrulls and all that stuff. And I, I guess you can't do that if Fox owns the Skrulls. But I'm 100% sure that Fox won't do it. Right. <laughs> hey, what's the, what's the deal with the Fantastic Four? They were supposed to be rebooted, right? Do they have a... I mean, I'm not like you're the lawyer or anything, but there's some kind of a time limit that their uh, ownership of the trademark, etc. will run out, right? And it will revert back to Marvel. Yeah, it depends. It goes from contract to contract. It's not all seven years or whatever, but the the holder of the copyright or whatever you want to call it, they have an option for X number of years. And mm-hmm. if you don't exploit that option, then, then the rights revert to the original, co- to the copyright holders who still should own the copyright. And in this case, it's Marvel and Marvel Studios is that. But Fox has talked about rebooting Daredevil and rebooting the Fantastic Four. And they've started talking about it more and more now because they said our first priority is Wolverine 2, which is going into production anytime now. And then we're going to take advantage of Jennifer Lawrence's contract and do a <laughs> X-Men first class, second class. And then we're going to do... And then we're going to do steerage. And then we're going to do... Uh, Fantastic Four and Daredevil. And both of those have teams attached, you know, directors and stuff like that. But they don't have green lights. They don't have a a start date. I don't know how much they pay attention to what's going on at Marvel. If it were me, I would say, you know, let's try and make our movies more like theirs. We own Fantastic Four and we own Daredevil and we own X-Men. Let's have them all cross over. But they so don't seem to care. What about Disney? You think there's a possibility that Disney would be willing to buy the rights back to any of those? I think so. I mean, Disney's pockets. Fantastic Four especially and Avengers are really kind of intertwined. Right, because they're two teams that are based right there in New York within a couple blocks of each other. And they're constantly they're running always, into each other. They're always challenge. getting together and teaming up and taking on big things together that seems like they should... I mean, I don't know how expensive and if it would be worthwhile because Fantastic Four movies did all right, but they didn't do great. They didn't do especially well. They weren't good, were they? No, they weren't. I mean, and that doesn't mean that a movie, I mean, Avengers didn't just do phenomenally well because it was good. Yeah, that's true. It's too early for that to be the case. But it's, you know, it has something to do with it. I mean, the excitement that is generated by a good movie is something that is probably as big a deal as a dollar sign 
You know what I mean? The, the people that walked out of Avengers, the ones that walked out with a huge smile on their face are going to go to it again and then, you know, buy it on Blu-ray or whatever and be first in line for Avengers 2. But Fox paid attention to how well Hunger Games did because right. they leapt on that Jennifer Lawrence contract. It's like, oh my gosh, look, we got this girl that's a huge star now and she's signed to do a possible sequel. Well, it's not just possible now. I mean, that seems really crass to me, but that's Fox. <laughs> All right. Should we cut this one down and finish up and start another episode? Or? Definitely. Okay. Well, so so thank you. If you've listened to all these weeks about Avengers, we had a lot to say, I, or I had a lot to say. You <laughs> sort of sat there and had to take it, darn it. I'm sorry. But uh, it was really enjoyable and it was fun to see other people that didn't have the emotional stake in it get emotionally involved in it. When I saw it yesterday, there was a girl not sitting next to me. Her boyfriend sat next to me and she was two seats away from me. By design. And when Hulk punched that alien monster ship sentry thing and killed it in one punch, I heard her say, this is the best fucking movie I've ever seen. <laughs> and it made me smile really, really big because she said it, not in an ironic way, but just like in a legitimate, I've never seen anything like this. Oh my gosh, kind of thing. And it was a girl. You know what I mean? And I know that I have a skewed idea of what, how the world works or whatever, or how comic book movies or how mo the movie industry works and all that. And I've offended people by saying that movies are made by men for men. But that, for the most part, has always been the way it worked. And, and maybe that's changing and that's a good thing because the world is changing and it's starting to become more equal and all that. But if a woman could see an Avengers movie that seems like it's such a boy's night out kind of thing and say it was the best effing movie I've ever seen, then Joss did his his job and, and the world suddenly got a, a little bit smaller. I was just really happy to hear this girl say it. I don't know why, because I don't know her and, you know, she might be a moron, but... <laughs> I don't care. I'm for, I'm for, that was the mind. first complete sentence she'd ever said. <laughs> in my mind, it was just like, wow, this translated to more than just people like me. Was, or whatever. And it was also the first movie she'd ever seen. Okay, stop. <laughs> Anyhow, that's that's what I walked away with. I, I Again, I keep talking as though I know Joss, but that's something I'd like to tell him someday is that there was this girl and she said this. And yeah, she wasn't wearing a Captain America t-shirt. She was there because her boyfriend wanted to see it. And yet she walked out as happy as this guy did. And then she the did what she could to make him happy. The next day she was wearing a Captain America t-shirt. There, there you go. And that's, <laughs> that's why we wanted, or I wanted, them to re-release old movies in the theaters so, so that people could discover things that they never even knew they were missing and that, and. and but, oh, well, you know, that's somebody who, let's say that those two get together and they have kids. She's going to buy that kid the toys. She's going to buy that kid a Thor hammer when he's four years old for Halloween or whatever it is. And, you know, it's just like Stan Lee's not going to be around forever, but that kid's going to have a childhood influenced by his creations that goes on unless you absolutely hate your parents <laughs> that stuff that is inculcated on you when you're a little kid stays with you probably for the rest of your life. All right. So we'll talk to you again next time, folks. Thanks for listening. And see ya. I'm Big Anklevich. I'm Rich Outfield. Good night. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Doesn't have to be, but it is. Because Emily Blunt is an actress, and Scarlett Johansson is... An I guess asterisk. A, a, movie, a movie star or, or you know, <laughs> whatever the other thing is.